There we go. Okay, thank you. Now that I've rehearsed <laughs> my opening segment here for Inside Fairfield, I don't know how much was able to be heard, maybe nothing at all. But anyway, welcome this evening to this edition of Inside Fairfield, the broadcast that we do live from City Hall uh, once a month before the first council meeting. And we try to go in depth a little bit on some of uh, the city issues that uh, are either impacted by the uh, tax dollars that we spend or issues that we're uh, going into. So uh, I've invited this evening uh, two sets of guests. One will be two members of the Convention and Visitors Bureau, Dave Neff and Tom Thompson. Uh, Tom is former city councilman. Uh, Dave has been uh, chair of our Tree Enhancement Committee for nine years, both very, very active in uh, city business and community affairs and we're very fortunate to have those two representing us on the Convention and Visitors Bureau. We are very curious to know uh, what stage we are with uh, the executive recruitment process for a director and also some of your future plans. So I think I'll just open it up, uh, Dave, and maybe ask you as chair of the committee to give us an update on where we are with our executive director search. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, at this point, we uh, started our whole process, I guess, when we first began our organizational meetings back in November, December, and went through the idea of putting a mission statement and bylaws, and so we have done some significant recruitment. We had 12 very good resumes that were presented to the committee, and Tom is, is on the search committee, so I'm going to let him talk a little bit more about it. And um, we have moved forward and had some local interviews here, and, but we're, uh, we're at the juncture where we're going to be making some good decisions for the, for the community here very, very shortly. So I'd like to, to pass this to Tom sure. since he's worked more directly with it than I have, and then I'll come back and tell you a little bit about the future and yeah, where we're please. going from there. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, we have had uh, we had 12 people. Uh, I, I, I admit, I don't know how many resumes we actually received. It was much more than that. But uh, we narrowed it down to roughly the 12. And, um, and out of that, we've had four of those visit uh, the community. Uh, they've come from various places in the country, uh, the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, we had extended an offer to one that we thought was, uh, and we were fairly certain that we were going to actually land a director at that time. Um, and just at the first part of last week, um, he backed out. He found another job uh, closer to uh, where his current place of residence is. Um, so we have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday at noon. Uh, we've been meeting quite regularly over the last uh, about six, seven months. And uh, to review the process again, uh, we're not sure if we want to go back, uh, well, we, we haven't decided if we're going to go back in and, and actually open it up to the, those 12, uh, if we're going to resubmit and, and ask for new resumes, I think. But, um, you know, we, we are getting the, the kind of uh, resumes for the kind of people we've decided, the kind of people that we think we would like. Um, it's just actually getting, a, getting someone here that we feel uh, will, will do the job and, uh, you know, that wants to come to Fairfield. So, let's say we we will be doing that though this this next Wednesday and in getting more resumes in and uh, hopefully narrowing down that process. We feel very fortunate with the quality of uh, applicants that we had. Uh, some of them have been at some very high level locations. Our our top candidate, as, as Tom said, uh, opted out this last week, but. Uh, we were just astonished at the at the background that these people have, and they're willing to come to Fairfield because, in, in this instance, they have a 23-month-old daughter. The quality of life is what they're looking for. They don't want to be in the large metropolitan areas where they want to raise a family in a in a warm, loving community and a place where you can uh, say it's the street lights come on, it's time to come home. Don't have to worry about where the kids are all the time. Going forward, probably our biggest, uh, besides the, the candidacy that we have going forward, is the uh, this weekend, uh, of course, the Sesquicentennial State Fair. Uh, we are members of the Eastern Iowa Visitors and Convention, uh, CVB, and uh, Tom and, and Phyllis uh, and uh, Brendan Narducci, who's my uh, uh, vice chair, and, and myself, will be in Des Moines at the Eastern Iowa Tourism booth all day Sunday. Uh, Brenda and I will start out the, the program from 9 until 3 and we'll be manning it with uh, two people from another county and then the afternoon Tom and Phyllis come in from 3 till 9 and they I think it's Fayette County is who will be the two people that will be there and so it gives us an opportunity to provide more exposure for Fairfield uh, especially Eastern Iowa but 
while we're there. That's that's our our promotion time. Uh, the opportunities that we see are to hand out copies. Uh, in fact, I saw on the back of Tom's vehicle and the back of mine and the, from the, the Fairfield Ledger and uh, some of the, the neat uh, things that have, have happened in the handout. And then uh, this last week we uh, sat down and did some brainstorming and tried to come up with the top ten reasons why people should visit Fairfield. And these were just our own decisions within the, the CVB board and Brendan Arducci was back today out taking pictures on a beautiful, as they'd call it, Chamber of Commerce Day for Fairfield of our top ten and we're going to put those into a three-fold brochure and we'll uh, have those to hand out along with Eastern Iowa, the piece from the ledger, and then our own brand new, freshly created uh, propag I mean, uh, informational sheet <laughs> about Fairfield, Iowa. Right. Well, I, d I don't think you'll be telling any lies in that in that literature, so I think there really is a lot that we have to offer here. You know, um, this has been a, a year also where we've seen a lot of the events that we know we're going to be able to promote and that will be attractive to people to come and visit uh, the art walks, some of the summer concerts, and uh, some of the opportunities for conventions in the city. Um, I think they've really taken a step up, uh, you know, uh, uh, upgraded themselves in the quality of what they offer people. I know this past art walk, there were um, you know many many people from out of town who've been to several now and they continue to bring people back. The opportunity I think is going to be great for someone. What kind of feedback have you been getting from some of the candidates that uh, you've had for the potential in, a, in our community for uh, really attracting uh, many tourists? I think the biggest thing that we hear from these candidates coming from the west and, and east is that they can't believe the energy, the excitement that Fairfield seems to have at this juncture. Uh, the when they both uh, the, the candidates we did have in, we we did schedule on first Friday art walk so they could see all the vibrance and the excitement around the town square and. Um, both were the, the people were just very very impressed with uh, this this level of, of energy that they. Uh, and they just don't expect to see when they when they come to a smaller county seat community. Uh, I think the opportunities that that uh, candidates have expressed to us are the the fact that we are uh, almost a halfway spot between Kansas City and and Chicago. We're a halfway spot between St. Louis and Minneapolis. And so, as there are events that may be drawn to larger communities. Uh, there's an opportunity to for us to draw from larger communities to come to to our, our Fairfield area. Uh, the same way with as as we even talk about the um, Civic Center and, and the the theater opportunities as uh, traveling uh, companies are going from one large metropolitan area to the other. That it's a it's a halfway stop that they could we could catch them on a Tuesday or Wednesday night where they're going uh, between a, a Friday Saturday Sunday performance and and we could catch them for maybe a half price and so those are things that have been brought up in the discussion that our location is is excellent. Uh, I think the other thing that we have talked about is the uh, just being a hub for southeastern Iowa. Uh, many of the other locations have only a theater or only a convention center but with our civic center the way it's drafted right now there'll be two two different pieces that can be used to draw and uh, and combine and have have some uh, some real excitement to, to go on with it so thanks Tom when uh, you were on the council we had a number of discussions about uh, the budget for the CBB have you learned anything more since being involved with the board now about um, what it's going to take to run one uh, properly in terms of salary, expen operational expenses, and um, promotion and publicity? Or do you think we're in the, about the right place to begin an operation like this to build on? I think that um, we made a decision early on that uh, we really didn't want to do a set of budget in stone until we actually got a director here because we wanted to have the director to have a lot of input into that budget. Um, but, but as far as the, the base things, there, there's so many other communities that have done those. So I think we have a pretty good handle on what we think it will take. Uh, and the revenues that we're getting from the uh, uh, hotel motel tax, I think will be sufficient, at least initially, for what we want to do. Uh, but as far as actually putting some real hard numbers together, we've been waiting because we want that director to be actively involved in the thing. and. Um, and I think that's the consensus of the of the whole committee. I mean, they want that that person to, uh, you know, have a good feel for it. It's something that they feel that they can live with. 
from a policy standpoint, have you discussed uh, how you're going to qualify people who are coming to uh, seek funds as grants to seed events that we talked about? I believe uh, we ended up with 10 percent of the uh, funding would go towards designated events that could uh, bring tourists into the community. Have you had any further discussions on that? We have uh, had the opportunity to put together an actual application at this point, and it's under review. Uh, we feel it's got most of the questions, criteria that we have listed uh, so that applicants can come in and uh, basically explain their case. Why, why should I be the one, our committee, our, our event be one to receive the funding? And we tell them that it's mainly for the marketing. It's not the, the dollars to pay for salaries or other things, but it's to help promote their event. They have to go through and give us a detailed listing as to what their anticipation is, as to how many people will they draw from out of town, how many bed, uh, beds will be occupied, how many uh, bed nights if it's a two- or three-day uh, event. And then we have the ability to go back and do a, a review in, after the event and check with the hotels if did they actually book this many, did that many people actually show up. And that's how we will uh, score the events. Uh, we originally had talked about doing uh, every uh, an annual and then semi-annual, and right now we're, we're looking more at a quarterly review, and that way people have to get information to us in a timely manner. We'll have a date published just like with uh, a deadline for applications for the next quarter. Then they can be reviewed and ranked and uh, actually uh, with, with numbers, so we're trying to put more objectivity instead of just the subjectivity into it. And uh, then uh, funds will be distributed and the evaluation will be completed and hopefully we can see the, the actual impact that it's having by more people staying for uh, combined events over over a two or three day uh, a longer weekend situation there too. Good and I, I appreciate the importance of quantifying that because uh, that's, that's uh, going to be precious dollars that are going to be spent and we really want it to go towards uh, the events that will really enhance our community. Well, I know you have a wonderful committee. Uh, I know that uh, you have been meeting quite a lot and it seems like it's generated a lot of good ideas and a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, we really look forward to uh, hearing about the hiring of a new executive director. I think it's a good time of year as well because um, this is the time when people are really planning for next year's events and promoting next year's events. So it would be an ideal time to uh, get that accomplished. So I thank you both for everything that you're doing and for the update. We really do appreciate it. And uh, maybe we'll have you back on with your new director when, uh, when they're in place. That would be so, great. Right. Be wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. All set. Thanks. Next, we'll invite in uh, two representatives of our Reservoir Development Committee. Uh, and we come on in. Sally Gavery and Frank Wintrobe. Frank is one of the co-chairs of the committee. And uh, as many of you know, we were very excited about the opening of our first uh, beach, public beach within the city limits. Uh, just about uh, 4th of July, I believe. We opened just a day or two before 4th of July. Yep. And um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how, the, how the beach was put together and um, the dollars that were spent. The money that, that uh, was used came from our local option sales tax uh, revenues. And I know we weren't able to do everything that we hoped we could do in the first year, but I think that the, uh, the beach has been a big hit. And I know there was a lot of good uh, efforts all around, volunteer, uh, that went into and planning that went into this. So I'd like uh, Frank, if you could start and tell us a little bit about uh, where we are with the beach right now and how it all came together. That's on. Yeah. So um, thanks for this opportunity, Ed. And uh, we are finally very excited to have the beach really working and and people getting a lot of use out of it. And I understand Sunday was the biggest usage day that we've had thus far. Uh, which meant that there were apparently cars double parked at the parking lot and up and down B Street with people going over to the beach. So uh, we have to evaluate whether we've actually made it big enough at this point, particularly since we haven't had any hot weather. Um, the process started about two years ago when Ed, uh, the mayor, appointed a committee to begin to plan for the recreational use of the reservoirs because the reservoirs which have been traditionally used for water for the city were not going to be needed for water supply any longer. We had dug Jordan wells, which are deep wells, to provide water. 
And so the committee uh, began to evaluate needs and sent out surveys in the ledger and in the water bill and uh, had things posted all over the city at the library and various other public buildings. And we took in about and 8% of the surveys came back and gave us a long list of things that people were interested in and hours and hours and hours of work to do to collate all the surveys uh, because they weren't done by computer, they were all done by hand. And uh, what we learned was that the beach and trails and improved fishing and uh, prairie preservation uh, were really high priorities. Uh, so the committee chose to focus immediately on four areas and divide it up into sub subgroups, and then we proposed a budget for various activities. And the beach was the first thing that we felt was an important addition to the way the city had, for the city to have some additional resources for recreation. Um, I guess we asked for around $40,000 out of the city's budget and the city managed in a very tight year to find us sixteen and a half thousand dollars which was uh, you know exciting for us and we managed to figure out a way with some uh, key suggestions by members of the committee about how we could actually get the beach developed and do a good job with it um, Gene yeah Eugene Thorne who probably most of the community knows as a Boy Scout leader and a, kind of a volunteer around town did the engineering and uh, which was a significant contribution and as did French Renneker also um, uh, volunteered a survey and a surveyor and which saved the community about $750 um, and extended our ability to make the beach happen and actually what ended up happening the way we made up the shortfall in our budget was we modified our plans but mostly we were able to enlist the cooperation of volunteers and sort of get the community spirit rolling towards getting the beach created and that made the project really extremely exciting um, the city managed to use its resources to bring in the sand and save a great deal of money because Glenn uh, Shalongoski was able to get his crew to bring over 170 truckloads of sand over a two-week period and the water department managed to loan us uh, equipment and manpower uh, with Danny Langstrad to get us, uh, you know, to save a lot of money on spreading sand and moving sand and main getting the, the beach area ready. And then we brought down the long sand slinger, which was this uh, basically very large conveyor belt, belt uh, from Des Moines that has, that has the ability to very carefully pinpoint where to put material. And uh, we spent two days and pretty much miraculously the beach was created out of that effort um, and we were careful to put two feet of sand in the water all the way out the beach is about uh, 100 feet from shore to the outer and uh, outer and then 80 feet north to south so that's kind of the quick overview I think great thank you and I know it's been very popular particularly with swimmers but uh, I think people really enjoy that opportunity it's I think it's really enhanced the use of that park as well and uh, is there anything Frank I know uh, we had talked about two stages of development for the beach uh, what would be the next stage of development for the beach well we had originally planned to do so, a rather elaborate uh, retaining wall to handle drainage and uh, fortunately, I think one of the things that came out of having a reduced budget was that we had to modify our plan and sort of change the design and look of that area. And to be uh, quite candid with you at this point, I think we're going to reevaluate those priorities as to what the next phase really will be. Uh, I think we're seeing things in usage that we didn't really anticipate. And uh, the way the beach is now laid out turns out to be ra rather desirable with half of it being grass and half of it being sand um, and uh, people seem to really appreciate that um, Sally and uh, a, a friend of hers who volunteered who's a landscape architect has made some suggestions about how to landscape to control the drainage the water flow so that we don't deteriorate the beach 
And so we're not quite sure what's the next step. Maybe we make it, make it bigger, maybe we add a floating raft, maybe we change the way the, you know, the other facilities around the beach, uh, the changing room, some of these things where we're gonna actually need probably some more public input. Um, but I do wanna put in a plug for safety at the beach. Um, turns out in, in doing the study that we have, we ran across some information, uh, the kind of the bottom line on that is that uh, a very high percentage, over 80 percentage of fatalities that occur at beaches occur while the the victim or the and generally children are being supervised and often being supervised by their parents, um, which is a pretty sobering. Um, and so we want to encourage parents to be very conscientious when they take their kids, because once uh, someone gets in trouble there in the water, um, you don't hear it and there's no real way to tell. Uh, it, basically, the Red Cross recommends that parents not read, not be chatting, not be listening to Walkman, not be eating their lunches, but be actually watching their children all the time. Uh, the beach is basically uh, three feet deep for a long way, I don't know the exact number, so that someone that gets in trouble can bob up and down. At the very outside, by the rope, it's six feet deep, and you can still bob up and down, but Basically, people should be very conscientious uh, about watching for safety. Right. Thank you, Frank, and I, I think that's a very important point, and I'm glad you're bringing that out, and I hope our signage out there reinforces what you're talking about as well, so people are constantly reminded. Uh, Sally, let me ask you, I know that we there, there were some other planning involved, and uh, I know your first love and your expertise is really in uh, prairie and preservation. Uh, what uh, elements of uh, preservation are, are planned for that area and for some of the other reservoirs? We're in the process of putting together a management plan, a resource management plan for not only the prairie, yes that is my love, but there are also woodlands there and water. So we are putting together a plan how to best preserve and maintain the prairie, the woodlands and the water. Um, the beach has been a wonderful way to bring people's attention to the water and the quality of water. Um, Jack Eastman has been wonderful in helping enlist people into taking the Iowa Water, water Monitoring Workshop that's offered through the DNR. And there are over a dozen people here in Fairfield who've actually volunteered to take that workshop. We've been trained in how to do testing for the water quality, um, different chemical tests and uh, observation tests that you do. So there's a nice core of people who've taken that training. Um, Woodlands is uh, something I'm not all that familiar with and we've been soliciting input from people who are much more familiar with that. Ray Lane has offered to play a, a key role in that as soon as we've determined what the objectives are. Why do we want woodlands? How do we foresee using the woodlands? So those are issues that we need to discuss. And then Ray uh, said he'd be more than happy to sit down and actually write a management plan with us. Um, we've been focusing on prairie management, which um, I don't consider myself an expert in prairie. I consider myself a, a definite enthusiast. I have no formal training in prairie. It's just something that has I've become exposed to having moved to Iowa. I am from the Midwest, from Wisconsin, where there is also prairie. But I've taken it upon myself just to become more familiar with it and to educate myself and mostly to network with the real experts who, who know about it. So again, we've been seeking input from different experts in terms of what's the best way to manage the prairie. But pretty much that boils down to burning. Uh, the, the value of burning a prairie to preserve the prairie is that it helps um, knock out woody species, shrubs that will invade a prairie. Um, nature, nature took care of the prairie, as did the Indians. Uh, there's now evidence from scientists that the Native American Indians actually intentionally burned the prairie. It wasn't just wild um, lightning strikes that set the prairies on fire. They were intentionally burned by the Indians. So consequently, last um, spring, uh, was our 
intention to burn quite a few of the prairie remnants around all three reservoirs. And we found out it's a huge job. It takes a lot of people, a lot of manpower, a lot of volunteer hours. We had 33 people involved in six burns um, involving about 200 man hours, having to borrow equipment from here and there. Um, and we've pretty much just scratched the surface. We did a lot at Waterworks Park along B Street. That area, Ron Myers told us, hadn't been burned in 20 years which is why there were, there were a lot of smaller trees encroaching on the prairie uh, and bushy species. So um, there are definite remnants all around waterworks that we need to hope, hope to burn this fall. We're going to conduct a, a, a burn school in the fall, a four-day burn school, actually, and um, hope to do, there's specific prairie remnants around Reservoir 2, and a lot of brush cutting that needs to be done around Red River Two years, a lot of work that needs to be done. And then actually Walton has some significant prairie remnants that need burning too. So there may be some smoke appearing this fall around the, the three reservoirs. Okay. Thank you. Just make sure it's during our burn season. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we take a lot of heat for that. Uh, no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> Sally, we're fortunate to have your enthusiasm and, Frank, your leadership. Thank you both very, very much for everything that you've contributed to that project. And we're very fortunate as a city to have those elements within our city limits uh, for our public to enjoy in our public parks. So it's wonderful to see the development that's going on there and I thank you for giving uh, giving us an update and especially congratulations on the opening of the beach. It was a great, great accomplishment. So at this time we'll uh, prepare ourselves for our live uh, city council meeting and uh, this evening on our agenda we'll be discussing in our police report uh, resolution and amending procedures on use of force. I think that could be an interesting issue for the council tonight. We'll also be approving a grant for, with, uh, for the FAA regarding uh, funding for our uh, airport project. We'll be awarding contracts for the service road and grading and drainage, several other items as well. So I invite you to uh, stay tuned uh, until uh, next month, uh, first uh, council meeting in September for our next edition of Inside Fairfield. I'm Mayor Ed Malloy, and I thank you for joining us this evening, and we'll see you at our council meeting.